happy 100th video, everyone. Now, you might be confused as apparently I have over 700 videos, but those were mostly walkthroughs, AMVs, memes, etc. This is, in fact, my 100th Five Nights at Freddy's essay video. And what better way to celebrate than to do a remake and re-enhanced version of my first? Back then, I was using a text-to-speech voice that sounded, well... Like this. Very stiff and randomly halting, sometimes even pausing in the middle of a sentence. And no way to really emote or get sarcasm across either. It is also very, very slow. But this isn't the only change. Some things have been tweaked and it's a two videos in one deal. Let's go back to our dear old friend Day Shift at Freddy's once more and cover old sports hypocrisy and Jack Zoll as an a-hole. Now before we get into the redone videos, let me give some overview to folks who may not be familiar with Day Shift at Freddy's. Day Shift at Freddy's is a Five Nights at Freddy's fan game series. It's a dark comedy with raunchy jokes and risque behavior, but underneath that it develops into a surprisingly complex and tragic story that mirrors FNAF's own. Unlike what one might assume by the often circulated memes and memorable moments in Day Shift at Freddy's, there's plenty of layers within the lines, and by the end of the series, it does manage to take itself remarkably seriously, and in some places might even outdo FNAF's story. To go over some of the characters, in Day Shift at Freddy's you play as Jack Kennedy, the man we will be talking about quite a bit in today's video. Jack is sort of the Day Shift equivalent of FNAF's Michael Afton and Henry, being an undead worker at Freddy's who continues to return in an attempt to amend his past mistakes. Well, that is, if you play the good route. Play the evil route and he's just a menace looking for a ticket to Vegas. Then there's Dave Miller. Likely you know this guy if you've any knowledge of Day Shift at Freddy's. Dave is the purple guy, the kitty strangler, a kebab-eating menace pulling various acts of debauchery throughout the series. Like in FNAF proper, he is really William Afton. But unlike FNAF, while still clearly being a monster and murderer, he was one created by his business partner, Henry Miller. Day Shift at Freddy's Henry Miller is the real William Afton, being the sadistic murderer who tortures others and does vile experiments, such as on Dave, and even has been clinging to life through possession and elsewise after his death. Doesn't mean Dave isn't part of it, but the big bad here is Henry. Another main character is Dee, the puppet. Jack's younger sister who was murdered by Henry and William one night when Jack forgot to pick her up. Throughout the series, through the good route, she and Jack work together to save the kids' souls. Then we have the phone guys. There's quite a few of them, but the most important ones are Scott and Peter. Scott and Peter are former workers who died in Springlock failures as a result of Henry, and were then refitted into phone-headed slave workers by Afton Robotics. Peter is actually Jack and Dee's older brother, but he doesn't remember until certain endings in Day Shift at Freddy's 2. Jack butted heads with both phones, but cooperates with them in the good endings. Now then, let's get into the video proper. Let's start by taking a leering gaze at Jack Kennedy himself. Like I said, unlike one might assume, Day Shift at Freddy's, while a parody fan game series, goes out of its way to craft complex characters with in-depth backstories. By the third game, it's clear it takes its story strangely seriously even with the jokes. Jack is the main character and the one who we play as. In the first two games, he is sort of just a quirky self-insert who does whatever you want. But by Day Shift at Freddy's 2, not only is his real name cemented in, but we also learn his backstory, about the loss of his family and his lengthy history with Freddy Fazbender's. But it isn't until Day Shift at Freddy's 3 that he gets his own voice. Figuratively and literally, he gets actual dialogue for himself letting us hear and see what he thinks. A bold step in turning a self-insert into a person of his own. Because of this, we learn more about who he is. And he is a hypocrite. So in Day Shift at Freddy's 3, Jack wants us to right the wrongs of the past and free any trapped souls. And he does this by using an old arcade machine to travel to the flip side, an alternate world where spirits linger, a, a limbo. The way the flip side segments exist are that all the good and bad endings of the past games are kind of canon. Think Undertale, in a way. It's not clear how exactly this works, but that means that technically the good and bad endings 
all happened and do exist at the same time. Likely so that the creator, Direct Doggo, doesn't have to make three or more separate scripts for one route of the game. This is important because this means that while Jack Kennedy is trying to save everyone, he is later in the game strongly suggested to have been a murderer of children at some point. This is very important for later. When Jack first enters the flip side, he finds the soul of Dave, who split from his springlock suit fused kebab eating rotten body. He is supposedly the better soul, not the murderer. Though this apparently really only applies to him. So it was likely a writing tactic to make a child slaughtering maniac in any way redeemable. He offers to lead Jack around and depending on your answers, Jack can either show some reluctance in teaming up or none at all. No matter what you decide, by the time Jack runs into the puppet later, his sister Dee again, he calls Dave his friend and is fully dedicated to help and save him. He is so dedicated to Dave, in fact, that he non subtly threatens to attack Dee when she gets upset about him teaming up with Dave. Dee ends up clobbering them both and winning the fight, but Jack talks her down and convinces her that they all need to work together to save everyone. Even though Dave has killed numerous kids, including Dee herself, and Jack is very aware that Dave cooperated in Dee's murder, he still wants to save him. This is a rather noble and selfless thing to do. Jack must really be committed to this cause, right? Well, sort of. Because when it comes time to save Steven, the phone guy, Jack is surprisingly nonchalant about not saving him. In fact, Jack holds a weird amount of disdain for Steven in particular. He asks, weirdly, if they want to save him. Which is odd since he was just raking Dee over the coals for not accepting that Dave was redeemable. Jack has doubts since Steven didn't treat them well, an argument that in a moment will become ridiculous. Dee is hesitant. Dave is on board. Jack gives a dramatic sigh and says, Yeah, we should save him. Then Jack has another hypocritical moment when Dee expresses doubt and asks if they should just like Jack just did, and he preaches that they are there to save everyone. Are we really here to save everyone, Dee? Well, that's not what you said five minutes ago, Jack. After confronting and fighting Steven, Jack has an especially condescending conversation with him. After placing his older brother Peter's death and transformation into a phone guy, not on his actual murderers or the companies controlling the phone guys, but on another phone guy, Steven himself, putting the blame squarely on him. He then assures him that they're here to save him. What follows is a long segment where Steven grovels about how he can't be saved, and Jack assuring that no matter how horrible and awful and repulsive his actions were, sure, he can save him. Here are the atrocities that Steven committed. He tried to frame Jack, and he sent Peter to the phone guy factory. As much as the game acts like the second was his choice, the Day Shift games also go out of their way to show that the phone guys are enslaved people who are brought back from the dead, have their memories wiped, and are forced to do as told. Steven did everything by Freddy's books. He did exactly what the higher-ups told him to do. Jack is well aware of this. Steven and Peter are both phone guys. They both butted heads with Jack. They both did questionable things. Peter was actually a lot more physically aggressive. But because Peter is Jack's brother, he is off the hook. All this talk about Steven being an awful person must stem from him framing him. But since this exists in a situation where Jack could have been a murderer, yeah, that's not too bad, all things considered. And yes, when Dave asks whether or not Jack did the crime he's being framed of, Jack can either say yes, no, or be either forgetful or dodgy. None of them were a lie, so any are possible. In the case that any of the evil routes were canon, Jack is actually guilty. Now, I'm not sure whether I can put the game's weird opinion of Steven on Jack's shoulders, but I can point out that he is willing to forgive Dave for killing his sister, ruining his life, and even framing him, as he was framed for Dee's murder by Dave. And depending on the route, Dave might have backstabbed Jack over three or four times over by now. Even in the evil route, he ditches Jack once or twice. And again, he murdered D. Now, why is this so important? It's because D is Jack's driving force, his biggest regret, his biggest shame, the reason he keeps trying. 
It's to save D because he feels guilty for letting what happened happen. But he's willing to forgive Dave on a dime. Now, I'm not saying Jack can't forgive Dave. But here's the thing. Jack somewhat forgave Dave even before he knew his tragic backstory. Jack is still doubtful towards Steven even though he knows exactly what he's been through. That he is a slave. That his life was taken from him. Now, you probably think that my point is that Jack holds Steven to a different standard than everyone else. And he does. But that isn't it. It's Dave. Jack says he wants to save those who cannot be saved. But he really means Dave. And his siblings, yes, but, but the confrontation with Dee shows how biased Jack is. To the point where he's willing to risk saving her, again, his driving force, to back up Dave. When Dee questions why Dave's here, Jack doesn't say he's on a crusade to save everyone. That he's Dave's untouched soul. That this isn't what it looks like. He says, Dave is his friend. Does that mean the evil endings are canon? It must, because elsewise he and Dave walked a couple of miles through some hallways together and are now best buddies. Jack seems completely tone deaf to why Dee would be against Dave being there. Then when she explains her entirely valid suspicions, his answer is to not talk her down, but to imply that Dave and he will fight her. It is also very condescending how Jack says it. D, look, I don't want to hurt you, but if you get physical, if you have a problem with me hanging out with your murderer, it sounds like borderline gaslighting, and I'm not dropping that term lightly. He is quite clearly saying, this is a you problem. You're acting irrational. He doesn't try to defuse the situation, and it does feel like he's choosing Dave over his sister. It is only after this moment that Dave gives his tragic backstory. Funny enough, D lampshades this with the line, The killer has a tragic past, so I, a victim of his actions, have to feel bad for it. And then they still proceed with Dave's long-winded backstory, where D gets all mopey and remorseful for how much of a sad person Dave really is. Now she knows what Jack knows about Dave. Jack might have had an inkling that Henry was the ringleader, pun intended, but he didn't realize how much control he had over Dave. There's no way. So he had to have thought that Dave willingly went along with what he did, as that's what Dave said on numerous occasions. Even at this point, Dave is blissfully unaware that he was manipulated. It really is a sad, sad story of a poor orphan boy. But it is so long that I was over it about 15 minutes in, and that doesn't count the 20 times I had to go over it recording all of the endings for my walkthrough guides. And no, it doesn't make Dave more sympathetic. It just makes him really, really stupid if he believed killing kids was making them all happy and sunshine and rainbows. I get it, brainwashing. But if Dave's this brainwashed, then he has absolutely zero autonomy of his own. No awareness. Which means that any time he cracked one of those funny comments, Dave was flying off in cloud cuckoo land. He didn't know what was going on. He has no awareness of his surroundings. He doesn't know how the world functions at all. Okay, let me get off of Dave and back on the Jack. This next moment isn't Jack being hypocritical, but him not really reading a room and being a little too self-involved. During day shift at Freddy's 3, Jack can hire on phone guys. One of them, Jake, is a sardonic and aloof fellow who you are able to get to open up to you if you find out the truth about his past. He tells you a harrowing tale about how he had a son and a family, and then he died, was turned into a phone guy, finally remembered and finally escaped and returned home to find that his son grew up without him. He leaves, unable to tell his son the truth or even show his phone face. He's devastated by the loss of his family of the moments they could have had of not being with him. And Jack briefly tells him about his experience as an orphan, growing up as his sister's provider, feeling an empty space from the loss of his parents. And then decides that this is a great time to go off on Dave's sob story, going into this long-winded, tedious recount of a tale he himself heard only recently. He makes it all about him, or, well, Dave. And the through line is, well, your son grew up okay. At least he didn't have a bad father. But like, Jack, you just overtook the conversation. You overtook a man finally opening up about his pain and decided to remind him that Dave's hurt more. 
This is the same thing he did with D. Okay, look, I know you're a victim, but Dave's good now. He hurts. He's a sad boy. My own long-winded point being that I can only assume Jack was, like, totally checked out during the story and just went back to the only person he can sympathize and empathize with. Himself and Dave. It is notable that from the way he tells the story, from his wording, Jack blames Dave's actions on Henry. Henry is the one who made Dave do the horrible things, and that is fair. But Stephen? Oh no, he was a special kind of garbage. He's totally at fault for his own actions. Now, all of this isn't to say that Jack is a terrible character. In fact, I find Jack's moments of being a flawed person a lot more interesting than the moments of where he lapses into speeches about goodness and the right thing and saving people, yada yada. Save that speech where he tells off Dave Trap in the back room. That's a pretty good one. I just thought it was worth bringing up, especially since the way the game frames it with Steven's groveling and the lengthy nature of his rescue seems to thematically back up Jack's feelings. Even D, who pretty much has no confirmed interactions with Steven, and Steven himself believe he is the worst person ever. Full stop. Irredeemable. It was something that got to me while I was replaying the game to make walkthrough videos so long ago, and recently rewatching the video, I realized that, yeah, I still feel the same way. That really burned me out having to listen to that sob story over and over again. And if I may, the reason I call it a sob story and not a tragic backstory, well, I did mention it as a tragic backstory, but the reason I call it a sob story is because it is so overly flowery and dramatic, and it's, I lived on the streets, everybody hated me, I ate out of the garbage, but I was such a spunky little guy. That's not Dave's voice at all, but just hear me out. And then Henry took me in, and Henry told me to kill kids, and Henry manipulated me, and then Henry tore me apart, and he cut out all my organs. And I'm listening to this, and I'm like, Oh god, I can't even click fast through this because I'm trying to record this. But, me personally, as someone who has heard a lot of traumatic backstories and is very involved in, like, building stories, the second I have a character going on for more than four paragraphs about some horrible backstory, I immediately check out. And I did hear really hard, especially when Jack's using it to lambast ever characters. In fact, I feel like this situation with Jack could carry easily into some characters in official Five Nights at Freddy's. Back to Jack. Jack is a rather neat character. He's not without fault, but he's not irredeemable because of it. He's not a goody-goody. He gets things wrong, but that makes him more interesting. One last thing that I think might be worth discussing and that I don't think was intentional is that Jack seems doubtful about saving Steven until Dave suggests they can. It could be that having Dave, the kitty strangler, suggest it reminds him that he's trying to save everyone, even a child murderer. Or it could be that he wasn't on board until Dave said it. Jack is a complicated fellow, but that aligns with his arc about trying to make up for his own mistakes and making amends. So it only makes sense that he isn't perfect. But it is somewhat misleading to talk only about Jack Kennedy and only include our old sport. As in reality, he is only half of Jack Kennedy. He is the body who was left behind after his death, who now seeks to right the wrongs done to him and by him. Just like with Dave, his own soul separated into a different form, somehow, taking the look of his old dog. Jack's soul became the one known as Shadow Doggo, or more properly, Black Jack. He's a character who frequently appeared throughout the Day Shift at Freddy's series. He started out as a joke about the complex lore of FNAF before becoming a major character in the third game. While Shadow Doggo cryptically appears and hints about a connection with Jack in Day Shift at Freddy's 2, it is not until the end of 3's good ending that we find out that he is his stray soul, and how Jack kind of sort of grew a second consciousness without a soul in one of those complexities that's best to not think about. It happened to Dave, it happens to Jack too. Jack is the body, and Black Jack is the soul. He is the life force. He is the original Jack Kennedy, and he is a major a-hole. That might seem like an exaggeration, but hear me out. Take Jack's flaws. Fredbear's hypocrisy and Henry's ego blend it up, leave it out in the sun for a few days, and then mold it into the shape of a dog, 
and you've got Blackjack. Blackjack is selfish, unapologetically offensive, and puts himself on a pedestal above everyone, even his siblings. But let's break it down. Upon meeting Blackjack and his introduction, he reveals that he is the one who killed Henry Miller and then trapped him down in the purgatory under the flip side. He then used Peter's soul to lure the rest of the monsters down there so that he could taunt Henry with them. No, I am not kidding. Blackjack outright refers to all of them as monsters as they're standing in front of him, including his siblings, while going off about how their deaths affected him in the same breath. Oh, uh, you have no idea what it was like to lose my sister. I loved her so much, I can't believe it. Look at that monster that she's become. Look at how disgusting she is. This is, of course, also after he refers to himself as the savior and the gatherer. Which you may remember from Day Shift at Freddy's 2, when he didn't do anything but whine when Jack did bad stuff. The savior who literally did one thing, and he botched that up too killing Henry, but keeping him alive. As Jack points out, Blackjack gave Henry immortal life. And not only did he foolishly think that Henry was going to feel remorse, which he should have figured he wouldn't, he killed dozens of kids and people, why would sitting in a black void make him feel bad? But he also allowed him to leak back out into the real world. And he knew this was happening. He claims that the longer Henry is there, the more power and spite he is growing. But how can he say that now after admitting to just leaving him there as a proper punishment? When does Blackjack's savior complex stop covering for his sheer stupidity? It was only a matter of time before Henry just walked himself out, really. But Blackjack's self-importance makes it impossible for him to imagine him not being right. Yes, this may be fueled by anger, but if his anger makes him this self-centered and stupid, then he should be called out on it. Remember, he and Jack are one and the same. He should have the same amount of intelligence as him. But the truth is, while Blackjack calls Jack plenty of heinous names about being a wasted husk or an abomination or whatever, he hasn't even a shred of Jack's emotional intelligence or empathy. Jack, the guy who I just critiqued for having a major Dave bias, feels more than Blackjack does for anybody else. Blackjack says that he intends to judge Henry and that then he'll make the decision on whether or not he can be forgiven. <laughs> It's all rubbish. It's garbage. Blackjack doesn't want to let go. Blackjack doesn't want to admit that he failed. He wants his own validation at any cost, and he doesn't care about much else. And since we last dealt with Jack's hypocrisy, let's delve into Blackjack's, because it's much worse. Jack just at least had an exceptionally weird standard for forgiveness. Blackjack just put himself on a throne of his own suffering and uses it to leverage his powers against everyone else. Powers that by the middle of fighting Henry, are revealed to be weak and useless. Blackjack is no stronger than anyone else. Dave's taken spite out in one hit while BJ's doing pitiful numbers before tapping out because Henry made him feel bad. While this happens to everyone, this is especially notable in Blackjack. He can dish it out, but he can't take it. And if I can take a step back to what I said earlier about how Blackjack doesn't care about his siblings, Dee and Peter, he just doesn't care about them. He cares about their deaths, as he uses them as points of self-pain and woe is me feel. He doesn't care about them as people, he just cares about how he was affected by their deaths. And is willing to use Peter as bait without even saying who he is. He is willing to force both of them to face their murderer for his own validation. And not to attack Henry, no no. It's just to parade them in front of Henry and lecture him on these disgusting creatures he created. And somehow that will suddenly make Henry have a change of heart. Blackjack can't possibly think this will work. And he doesn't care how his own siblings will feel when their murderer starts admiring his work. He doesn't consider how hard it might be for them. He doesn't ask them. When they do speak up, he just shuts them down. Because this is his story, and this is how it's going to go. Blackjack is, in fact, the real monster, and the worst monster of the lot, save Henry Miller. And the worst part is, unlike Jack, he doesn't really get redeemed. Yes, he is convinced that his actions are utterly foolish, but only after he gets to wallow in his pain longer, Blackjack soaks up the attention, and then he lets him confront Henry. And then in the end, he gets rewarded for his many mistakes, his selfishness, and everything else. 
He gets to move on to a brilliant afterlife while his body, Jack, the one who actually did everything, the one who actually saved the day, fades away. I think that is the main reason why Blackjack is so infuriating. We don't get to know him long, but the time we get with him is when he's at his worst, and it is directly followed up with us losing the character we have grown so attached to. That makes things like his foul behavior harder to connect with, his situation, and then move on. Blackjack, like the rest of them, is a victim. He just has a massive complex that there isn't enough time to work through. He doesn't even get a speech at the end where he says something to Jack, or apologizes to anyone, or does anything other than acting like the wise old soul who knew better, like the mentor role when he doesn't deserve it. I feel like if Blackjack had a moment with Jack where he recognized he was wrong, or even expressed some regret to him or the others, that it would have at least made all this easier to tolerate. It would have felt a lot less smug as he gets carried off to Never Never Land with Dave, who is apparently Jack's true love. Imagine if some random dog showed up and stole Princess Peach from Mario. Now imagine if that happened again. My point being, it could have salvaged his character just to show that little ounce of remorse. All it had to be was an, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that to you. I'm sorry you can't come. I'm sorry I misjudged you. That would show at least a hint of growth. Because after all he rambled off of earlier, I just don't think he cares. You can say that he learned the error of his ways when Jack unlocked his memories, but the dialogue doesn't suggest that's what happened. He validates his feelings. Which, fair move on Jack's part. It worked, didn't it? But it doesn't make the dog look any better. Also, if I can be seriously petty, what is with the dog thing? Why change to make yourself a dog? Because you're ashamed of your past actions? Well, he should be. Because if what he says is true and Jack is just a husk while he's the real Jack, then he is responsible for Dee's death. Yes, Henry and Dave killed her, but Jack dumped her off at a Chuck E. Cheese, not a daycare, got sauced, forgot to pick her up, and then showed up too late to save her. Maybe that's it. And maybe that's why Blackjack holds so much contempt for Jack. Since they have divided, he can turn all his guilt into blame and settle it on Jack's shoulders. Even if he then flip-flops on Jack's individuality, accusing him to be the monster Jack was, but then telling him he's not Jack at all. Blackjack adopted another identity to separate himself for his past actions, yet snatches it back when he needs it to make himself more important. He never showed real remorse for it. He takes all the regret for the sadness and pain, but he takes none of the responsibility. Now, I know I have been rather harsh on Blackjack through this whole, whole ordeal, and the reason for that is largely because of how off-putting he was. I'm not saying that Blackjack doesn't have a reason to be angry, and it makes sense that he is, but his self-entitlement isn't doing him any favors. Perhaps now that he's free, he can work on being a better person, or dog, or fade off into the void. He has that chance unlike some people. At least, at the end of the day, Jack Kennedy went out as a hero, even though he might have been a hypocrite. When it came time to buck up and do it, he did, and he was willing to put himself aside for everyone else. Blackjack wasn't. And Blackjack is the one who's going to be rewarded in heaven and spend the rest of his days with Jack's man. Thank you for watching.